got our next speaker here, uh, which is Katie DeCora. Katie's calling from New York, where she works as a front-end engineer for Macbox. And today, she's talking about unconventional use cases for Jekyll. Uh, over to you, Katie. Hi. Hello. All right. Hello. All right. Let me share my screen with you all. Share. Cool. All right. So like my... Like Mike just said, I'm going to be talking about unconventional use cases for Jekyll. And to start, hi, I'm Katie DeCora. I'm a writer, supporter, and tinker at Mapbox. And when we talk about unconventional use cases, I'm totally going to give you a quick heads up. that This is AKA how to make your computer really hot, AKA this is not performance talk at all. And to start, I'd love to tell you all like why I really love Jekyll. Um, my very first pull request of, for, of ever, of my GitHub experience, was actually to the Jekyll um, documentation site. And it was something super, super small. It was like a tiny typo. And I was really nervous to create my first pull request. Um, but I did, and the maintainer, I don't remember who you, who you are, but you, I remember you sent me a Jekyll emoji, or emoji heart, and that made me feel so good and welcome to the community. And then from there, I just started blogging a ton, talking about my, my code pen and my Jekyll experiments because I was looking for a new job. And then I ended up getting recruited by Mapbox, and now I get to use Map, uh, Jekyll every day at Mapbox. And so that's why I really love Jekyll, um, among other reasons. And so when I'm creating projects, people often ask me, OK, why are you always choosing Jekyll? And besides obviously loving it so much, I have a couple of more, you know, more concrete reasons why I love Jekyll so much. Um, the first one is Jekyll is just really good at making templates. Um, it has to be, right? If you're creating a new blog post, you don't want to have to declare the doc type, the, the meta tags, the title, all your assets. You don't want to have, have to write in all your your navigation and your footer, you just want to blog. And so Jekyll makes it so easy for you to create layouts, for you to create includes, so you're not repeating the code and you can do what you're there to do, which is blog it's, or to you know, build your website so you can focus on your content. And because it's so good at making templates, it's really good at um, making your workflows a little bit faster. And I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of tired of writing um, HTML. And not to throw shade at HTML, I love you HTML, but you're very predictable, you're very repetitive. It's a lot, a lot of uh, creating new tags, closing them, adding attributes, and there's also a lot of room for human error, but it's so repetitive, and sometimes you just don't want to have to write it. And so, um, so it kind of brings me on my little mission that I've started, it's that yeah, sure, I could write something by hand and that would take me 20 minutes, but I could probably make something in Jekyll, I could work on it for an hour with a lot of logic and make something that's really smart and then I, w I, then I don't have to go back and tweak it as much. I can just do little things here and there and everything will just build and I'll have this really smart scalable system. Another reason why I really like Jekyll and I choose it for a lot of projects is that there's very few resources to get started. And so this means that um, aside from actually installing Jekyll, I can type in the command line Jekyll new and boom, I have a new project started. Or really if I just have a config file and sometimes you need very little data in your config file and poof, you have a site. And I think like having this less friction be, makes you want to start a new project. It makes you want to experiment more. And you don't have to jump over hurdles. You don't have to worry about dependencies. You can just have a Jekyll site and you can just go at it. And so for the rest of my talk, I'm, I'm going to be talking about some of my experiments that I've had with Jekyll and how I've solved a lot of problems with Jekyll and how I've built some really cool things with Jekyll. And to preface, I'm going to be talking about my experience and a lot about mapping, um, like web maps, because I do work at Mapbox and we, we, have, we build a, we are a developer, we have developer tools for uh, mapping, so that all kind of combines in there. Okay, so my very first experiment, well, I guess it was more or less a problem, started a couple years ago. I really wanted to create a single map using the data in the front matter of multiple posts. 
And to illustrate, so here are a couple posts that I had, and they all had very similar uh, front matter. So they all have a title, they all have a category where the value is adventures, they all have an image, and they all have coordinates. So basically what I'm trying to make is a map, and I'll have pinpoints for each post, and just to show, you know, where I've been throughout the course of the year, or just, you know, just a course of how long I've been blogging. And so I was like kind of scratching my head, like where do I start here? Because I've been really used to creating new HTML files and then looping through my posts and I could get my post coordinates, but I don't need HTML, I don't need markup. What I really need is I need JavaScript, I, need, I, I really need geodata. And so I wasn't really sure, like can I use Jekyll and JavaScript together? Like how, how does that really work? And I hadn't, seen, I hadn't seen really a lot of examples, so I decided just to try it. So I created, um, oh, actually to step back, um, when, I say geo, <laughs> when I say geodata, I mean um, this is a JSON file called GeoJSON. And as, when, you, when you look at it, you see that there's a lot of repeatable parts. So uh, for GeoJSON, to define for each of my posts, I'm going to need to know some of the properties of my posts, and also I'll need to get the geometry. So I'll be talking about points and coordinates. And so, as you can see from this GeoJSON file, there's a lot of repetition here. And so, how can I weave that in and make Jekyll kind of make this for me? So, jumping back to where I was going before, I decided to create a new JavaScript file. And then I dropped in those six hyphens that kind of tell Jekyll, hey, I want you to do stuff in here. And then I started to add some front matter. So I just added a title, just anything, just kind of my, um, you know, hello world. And I wanted to see if Jekyll will evaluate a, a JavaScript file. So I nervously hit serve, it compiled, and I opened it up, and oh my gosh, it worked. It totally worked. And it was just so exciting. But I mean, okay, why wouldn't it work? It's worked in, Jekyll works in Markdown files, it works in HTML files. So why not, why not JavaScript files? But oh well, I still consider this a big success for myself at this point. Um, so I kept pushing forward. And so I decided to create a variable called data. And this is where I'm going to store my GeoJSON, that file format I just showed you a couple slides ago. And basically, I, I used um, some of that as a template, and I decided I'm going to loop through all my posts, but only where the category equals adventures. And then I am creating a feature for each one. I'm describing the title, I'm adding a description, and I'm adding the URL to link to the post. And then, of course, I need that geometry so Mapbox knows how to put it on the map. And I'm using it. There'll be points, and here's the coordinates. And so when I put that through and I serve it up, I get this really beautiful GeoJSON file. And I see I have three features, one for each post, and all the data is in there nice and tidy. And then using Mapbox, Mapbox.js actually in this point, um, for, this, for this demo I use Mapbox.js, it's a JavaScript library that we have. Um, I was able to put on each of those points on the map. And the really cool thing here is that when I add a new blog post, it automatically drops a new point on my map. So I don't have to touch that code ever again. And I can, they just keep adding and adding and adding, which is a really cool feature to have. And so after creating this little project, I started thinking, like, what else can I do with this? Like, now that I know that I can bring Jekyll kind of anywhere in my site, where else can I take it? So um, about a year ago, I came across a map that looks a lot like this. And basically this map is, what it's doing is it's highlighting very specific countries. And then it does this to describe some data in a way. Um, maybe the, the country shapes are colored differently based on the data you're describing, or you can click on them, you can learn more. Um, but basically I wanted to figure out how to create a map like this. And before I move forward, um, I kind of changed my use case here for what I actually created. Um, so this is actually a map of all the Jekyll Comp speakers today and where the countries they're representing because we're such an international country. Okay, so moving forward. So to create this type of map, what I need is I need data. So I need data about all the speakers, and I need to get shapes of each country. 
And so the first one, I need data. So that wasn't too that wasn't too hard. I went to the Jekyll Comp website and I looked at three everyone's Twitter bios and had to go through some LinkedIn profiles to get all the information I needed, which wasn't that too much. Um, so I created a speakers.yaml file and I saved this in my data fold in my data folder, my Jekyll site. And for each speaker, they, I have saved their speaker this, the name of the speaker, their Twitter handle, their country, and the talk, the name of their talk. So I have us all in here. And the next thing I needed to do was I needed to get the shapes for each country. And I was able to find an open source uh, uh, world GeoJSON file. I ended up converting it from, Geo, uh, from JSON to YAML, even though data files do accept JSON. The file was just really big, so I had to condense it down and move some of the, some of the metadata. So it was would uh, serve a little, a little bit faster, um, and so I have about 108 countries, um, and I have all their coordinates so that um, so that I can draw it on the map. Okay, so next, okay, so I have my data, I have my country shapes. Next, what I need to do is I need to assign the speaker data to each country shape. But okay, let's take a step back and look at that country shape data once again. I'm going to be showing you um, just a single GeoJSON feature of Argentina. Whoa, okay. That's a lot of data. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty big country. Um, those coordinates are basically drawing the shape of Argentina. As you can tell, Argentina is big and it's, it's complex. Now imagine having a data file of 180 countries of this size, of data size bigger and smaller, it's just kind of an overwhelming amount of data to have to sift through and work with. And so I started thinking to myself, well, huh, this does not look fun to edit. And there's so much room for human error, there's so many opportunities for me to make a mistake, and what if we add another speaker, I'm going to have to go find the shape again, I'm going to have to add, I have going to have to add the speaker data back into that country. And so basically what I'm saying is I was too lazy and I didn't want to do it by hand. So what if I could make Jekyll do it for me? And so what came of this was now I need to learn how I can weave together two data files. So looking at this data once again, one thing it has in common is that each, each, um, each data um, file has a country. So this has a country, and then this has a country. So basically what I need to figure out is how can I match those two and marry them and have wedded data bliss. Okay, so I thought to myself, well, why don't we start by creating a new GeoJSON file. I'm going to create a GeoJSON file this time instead of a JavaScript file. And I built out my template. So this will be, be where I will put my loop, and I'll loop through each country. And this is going to be the data that I want to get for each country. So I thought, well, I could loop through every single country, and it would look like this, where I'm saying for each country in the country's YAML file, I want to loop through, and I want to create a feature for each. But the problem there is that I really don't need every country. There's 180 of them in that file. I only really need about a handful, I don't know, like less than 10. Um, and so I realized that I should be using the data in my speaker's file to decide what countries I actually need. And so I returned back to my GeoJSON file, and what I did here was I, 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 I kept the same, the, the original for loop. The, so I'm looping through all the countries, but then I nested another loop, and this was really like the bread and butter of what really helped make this whole problem, this whole experiment work, is that now I'm looping through all my speakers, but then I'm doing an if statement. So now this is where I'm going to do that matching. So when a country, um, a country name and the country's loop matches a speaker name, the speaker's loop. That means we have a match and I want that feature. And so create a feature, but if, if there's no match, like just keep going, Jekyll, just like keep looping through, keep doing your thing. And so that worked really great for me. But the problem here was I ended up with a lot of duplic duplicated data. So I had a bunch of United States, I had a couple from the UK, what I really needed was distinct data. I need a distinct list of countries from speakers from the speaker's data file. Okay, so I returned back to my GeoJSON file and I did a little bit of uh, 
like a little bit of work to figure out how I can get this done. And so basically what I decided to do was I created a new array and I'm calling that distinct countries. And here I am looping through all the speakers and I'm checking to see if that speaker's country is already in the array. And if it's not, push it to the array. But if it's already in there, then just keep going. And what I ended up getting was this really, really nice array of just the countries that we're all representing today. All, I think about eight of us, or eight countries. Okay, perfect. So, I need one more thing. I need to get more data about all my speakers. I'm going to store them into arrays. And much like how I just did the distinct, um, distinct countries array, I'm going to do that for the speakers, the Twitter handles, and the talks. And the really neat thing here is all, that all these arrays are related, and the position is really important. And I created them in a very symmetrical way so that, it, so that they can line up. For instance, when I want to get position one of, the, of, of all the arrays, I will get Netherlands, where Amy Johnson is from. Here's her Twitter handle, and here's a talk that she gave earlier today. And how about position, position three? We get the United States. We get a whole bunch of people who are speaking from the United States, including myself. We get all their, all their Twitter handles. And then we get all of their talks. OK, so I have all my data. So I return back to my GeoJSON file. Now it has a lot of stuff. And here's where I was give you give the disclaimer. This is not a, a talk about performance. But here are all my, my arrays that I created to store all that data. And now here, um, returning to my, uh, my GeoJSON loop, um, the main thing I changed here is that in the, second, in the second loop right here, I am no longer looping through the speaker's, the speaker's file. Um, instead, I'm looping through my distinct countries array so that I will only get the amount of countries that I actually have. And what I'm, what I'm also using here is I'm, I'm using the uh, for loop index so that I can symmetrically get at each point all of the information that I need from all those other um, arrays that I created earlier. And so the output is this really beautiful GeoJSON file. Um, so we see the very first feature here is Brazil and Julio, who spoke earlier on Jekyll AWS. And we say we only have one speaker there. And we also have the geometry of Brazil right here. I'm going to scroll down here to the United States, because that one has a bunch of people. Um, so, we see, so here's the United States' feature. Uh, there's 13 speakers, all the speaker names, the Twitter handles, the talks, and of course, um, the really important geodata that we need. For, um, so I can use Mapbox to add it to, onto a map. So the, also what's interesting here is that uh, these, uh, these arrays are also in a very symmetrical format. So as you see, um, the very first one, um, Bud, his speaker name is here, his Twitter handle is here, and his talk is here. And so then I went ahead and I loaded it on a map. This time I'm using Mapbox GLJS. Um, so it's so smooth and slick. And so when you hover over a country, we get um, that data just visualized. And Mike, I think I accidentally put you in the United States, so I'm sorry that I uprooted you. Um, but uh, so the other neat thing is when you hover over here, I can link to their Twitter. And I'm also uh, using another um, API in here. It's called avatars.io. So I, I'm actually using um, the, the Twitter handle array that I have. It's also interfacing with another API to pull, pull in the images here. Uh, I did that really quick this morning. <laughs> So you're probably wondering, wow, why did you go through all that work, all those loops, just to get a map like this? Um, well, let me remind you that if I need to make updates, I only have to touch this file. I do not have to touch any of the other code. I don't have to touch the country's data file. I only have to come here. So for instance, if we decided to add another speaker, say they're from Iceland, all I have to do is add their new item, you know, add the, the data that I needed for each, like their speaker name, their Twitter, their country, and their talk, save it, Jekyll will serve, 
Jekyll will go run through all those loops. It'll grab the country, the new, you know, Iceland geometry. It'll weave together the data, and it'll automatically add it to my map for me. And same thing about if I need to update someone's country. Um, all I would need to do is edit it here, hit save. Jekyll will serve. It'll run through those loops I created, and boom, it's already done. So kind of created this really neat little scalable solution here. So one also thing that's another thing that's neat is I can write about the data and I can create a narrative that is very seamless. So I can ask how many speakers are at Jekyll Conf and how many countries are represented. And I can find out Jekyll Conf has 22 speakers from eight countries. And this is what it actually looks like, the raw version. So I'm using a lot of that data, the a lot of that data and the variables I had used earlier to make the map. I can also find out which country has the most speakers. And it is the United States. They have the most speakers this year with 13. And here's what the raw version looks like. Got a little small. Um, and here I'm using some of the data that I used before. I also created a new variable where I was able to figure out uh, which country had the, the, had the largest size speakers. I grabbed that index and I was able to evaluate it again using distinct countries. So what other data can I weave in here? And so this is where I kind of had fun playing around. So I ended up finding some data about time zones. And I created another data file called time zones. Um, and some of them were a little bit tricky because some countries are you know, very big and have multiple. So I just kind of met in the middle. Um, but for instance, like I can find out right now that the hour is 2100 for Irie in Nigeria. Um, I also played around and played around and I need this a little bit more semantic, and so it's breakfast time in New, in New Zealand for George, and in France it's late night snack time. So Tim, I hope you're enjoying late night snack. Um, and then I also got some bird data too. I found out all the national birds, and I created a bird YAML file, so <laughs> we can find out New Zealand's national bird is a kiwi. Um, so <laughs> you know, some of this is kind of silly um, and unconventional, but. Uh, it's a, I just want to get your way, your your brain thinking of some of the fun ways you can use this, and there's a lot of conventional ways you can. Just thinking about um, like how many blog posts have a uh, have a particular tag, or what topics you talk about a lot, or even like which what domains do you link to the most. There are so many conventional ways you can play with your data, and really, there's so much you can find about your site. Um, whether you're just blogging or you're, you have a, a, a consumer product. And there are also so many problems that you can solve with Jekyll and you can create really amazing scalable solutions. Um, and I highly recommend if you're new to Jekyll or if you're new to tinkering with Jekyll, I highly rec recommend reading all the Jekyll documentation, especially um, brushing up on Liquid. Um, there's so many amazing filters that can really help you build really, really cool systems. I also recommend experimenting as much as possible. Even if you don't think it's going to work, or even if you think it device a convention, go for it. I mean, all it's really going to cost you is a couple seconds of Jekyll serving, right? And I also highly recommend searching. Um, the really cool thing about Jekyll being um, for bloggers is that um, the people developing it are going to blog about <laughs> what they're building. And so I highly recommend just seeing what other people are building because a lot of people have been writing about it. And finally, um, if you ever figure out something really cool and you have an aha moment, please, please, please write about it. We all want to know what you're working on. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you're welcome to find me on Twitter. You can see my slides. And I also have my GitHub repo, which has my slides as well and has all those demos and all that data file and all those crazy loops that I created for today. Fantastic. Um, I think we need to update the Jekyll Conf website and get some, some maps on there of the speakers. Um, yeah, that was, that was a really great use case using Jekyll Conf. Um, so thanks for that. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, we have a few questions here. Um, so the first one is, I know it's a fairly simple um, website with, no, well, there's not a lot of speakers at the moment, but what is the build time of that site at the moment? Yeah, let me see. Uh, 2.5 seconds. Okay. It's, it's uh, not bad. It's not yeah. terrible. It's pretty good. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I guess there would be, yeah, there might be ways of optimizing that as well. Um, I think so too. Yeah, I was, try, I was trying to think the um, incremental regeneration probably wouldn't be too much help because it's going to have to cycle through all those loops anyway. Right. Um, I guess it depends on what you've changed too as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so the second question is, um, you had some code um, that was doing a split um, to create an empty array. Um, so it's a two-part question, like why did you need to do that and how does that work? Oh, that's a really good question. To be, to be completely honest, um, I wasn't sure how to create my own array. And so from some Googling uh, and some searching, that's what I found was a really good convention. And 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 what it did was it was able was able to put it in was was able to create my array for me. Um, I don't know if I can speak more exactly to the the technique that I used there, but it was a lot of from search. Yeah, yeah, no thanks. Um, yeah, and the final question. Um, oh, let me think. Oh yeah, do you want to just talk about some of the other Jekyll use cases you've been working on? Oh yeah, sure. So one really goofy one that I created recently is called Emoji Frame. Um, I can tweet out a link. It's keydecor.com slash emoji frame. And so I was it's kind of a meme that I that didn't really take off very far at Mapbox, where you can type in some words and you can put a literally a, an emoji frame around your words and copy and paste it into Slack or GitHub. And the really fun thing there is that I was using a JavaScript library um, called Emojify, um, but then I, I, I also needed to, to tweak it a little bit, so I'm loading those images and I'm actually uh, loading them into the JavaScript file. I was using, um, actually using some of the static file loop. I was able to, and looping, looping through all the emojis so I can create, <laughs> so I could customize the JavaScript. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll link that out. That was a really fun project to work on. Awesome. Yeah, please do. I'd love to see it. All right, thank you so much for speaking today, Katie. Thank you.